This is the Emergency Medical Minute, sponsored by Health One. Go. Uh, I'm going to talk about decompensated liver failure. Uh, a lot of times we'll see patients come in with ascites. Uh, realize that those people who are coming in, not necessarily here just to get tapped, but have the potential to be very, very sick. Um, cirrhosis is the end stage of chronic structural damage to the liver. Usually the patients we see are from alcohol, but it can be viral and other causes, can be drug related. And that's important because the liver does a lot of really good stuff for us. Uh, it makes the complements that are involved in inflammatory process and healing, it makes a lot of the all the clotting factors really, uh, protein S, protein C, fibrinogen, all those things are involved in clotting. So that's why you see your cirrhotic liver failure patients bleed quite frequently. Um, the patients get in trouble for a couple of things. One is infection and the other is GI bleeding. GI bleeding, especially from esophageal varices that are associated with alcohol. Uh, for the, the patients that we're trying to decide, are they really sick or not sick? There's a really simple shock index you can calculate and it's the ratio of systolic blood pressure to heart rate. If that ratio is greater than 0.7, that patient is potentially sick. If it's greater than one, they're really sick. So if you have a, a pulse of 120 and uh, a pressure of 120, that's already one. So you gotta think about those, those patients being potentially very sick. Um, the, the key to treatment for these patients, for the infectious patients is realize that a lot of them are potentially immunocompromised and don't manifest all the common signs and symptoms we might expect from uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis with belly pain and fever and white count. As a matter of fact, about 13% don't have any of the symptoms. So you have to suspect it. And you, if you're concerned about that for the patient, you should have a very low threshold for doing a paracentesis and examining the fluid. The magic number for fluid is a PNM count of greater than 250. Um, those patients should receive ceftriaxone. So that's, that's the treatment for those patients. Also albumin. Uh, albumin is also made by the liver and albumin is an important protein that maintains what's called oncotic pressure. That keeps our blood pressure up. It, it, it keeps fluid inside the vascular space. Without the protein in your, in your bloodstream, without the albumin, then all that fluid leaks out. And that's why patients get edematous and that's why they become hypotensive because of relative hypovolemia. So we give them albumin and we give them ceftriaxone. Uh, for the patient who's the GI bleeder, uh, realize that again, we give them blood quickly. And what blood do we give? We just talked about it. O positive for any male. Yeah, give it right away. And for, for, and for women over 50, or we give O negative for women under 50 or childbearing age. Um, the, the other thing that's most important, and we don't often do it, is also give antibiotics. It makes a difference in mortality and potentially morbidity. The num we do this thing called numbers needed to treat in terms of seeing how many patients do we have to treat with ceftriaxone, who are GI bleeder cirrhotic, to impact the potential for infection. That number needed to treat is only four. And for impacting mortality, it's 22. So relatively simple thing to do to make a big difference in the patient's care is the GI bleeders give blood quickly and also ceftriaxone. I will just say parenthetically, you'll also see us often treat with protonics. And then for patients we think who have um, uh, esophageal varices will give octreotide. Actually, the numbers show that that really doesn't make a difference in mortality. More than that is giving ceftriaxone in the GI cirrhotic leader. Okay, thank you. We are on a quest to provide the world with free medical education. Please help us out by rating us on iTunes, following us on social media, and subscribing to our newsletter at emergencymedicalminute.com.